Good afternoon. I'm John Bitson, the Menard Family Director of the Sheila and Robert Challey Institute for Global Innovation and Growth. Welcome to the Menard Family Distinguished Speaker Series. We're thrilled today to be joined by Ambassador Susan Schwab, who was U.S. Trade Representative from 2006 to 2009. She was very heavily involved in negotiating in the Doha Round of the World Trade Organization. She also successfully negotiated several regional trade agreements and started several other regional trade agreements. And Ambassador Schwab has a vast amount of experience in public service. She has a really good understanding of international trade and trade issues. So we're all going to learn a lot today. We have over 200 people that are registered for this today. So you'll get your own chance to ask questions of Ambassador Schwab during the presentation. So please, at any time, if you have any questions for Susan Schwab, please submit them in the Q&A feature of Zoom. And I'd like to thank the Menard family and all of our donors for making this possible. And a special thanks to Pat Stocker, who is an alumna of NDSU and a longtime supporter of the College of Business at NDSU. And so um, without any further delay, I'd like to start with an introduction of Susan. So Susan C. Schwab is Professor Emerita in the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland and Strategic Advisor to Mayor Brown, LLP. Ambassador Schwab served as U.S. Trade Representative from 2006 through 2009 and as Deputy U.S. Trade Representative from 2005 up until 2006. In academia, she served as Dean of the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. Earlier in government, she served as Assistant Secretary of Commerce and Director General of the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service. As a trade staffer and legislative director for Senator John C. Danforth, and as a foreign service officer at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. She began her career as an agricultural trade negotiator at USTR. She holds a bachelor's degree from Williams College, a master's degree from Stanford University, and a PhD from George Washington University. Welcome, Susan. It's really an honor to be able to talk to you this afternoon. Uh, thank you, John. Much appreciated. And uh, thank you to the Challey Institute, the Menard family, and to Pat Stocker. Yeah, thank you to all of, all of you as well. This is really great. And so before we start talking about some of the trade issues that are facing the U.S. and maybe some broader trade issues, I'd like to talk about your background a little bit because I think it's really interesting to learn about how your background has played a role in your career choice and maybe have some other people thinking about how you know, it may influence their career choice. And so one of the first question I'd like to ask you is that you're from a foreign service family and you grew up in Asia, Africa, Europe. Um, and so I'm curious, uh, what kind of role did growing up in foreign countries have and maybe being part of a foreign service family have in your desire to be in public service and maybe your desire to be involved in international issues in general, and then maybe more specifically in issues related to international trade? Uh, thank you, John. Um, yeah. Absolutely right. I, I uh derived my interest in international from being in a foreign service family, from living abroad, particularly living in developing countries and living in developing countries with incredible, in many cases, incredible poverty. Uh, and uh, then wanting to represent my country and serve my country the way my parents did. So those were the two initial motivating factors, sort of wanting to save the world on behalf of the United States of America. The trade part came later, actually, and I kind of backed into the trade field. Uh, I wanted to do development economics, and so I went to graduate school at Stanford at a program sadly it doesn't exist anymore, but a program called the Food Research Institute uh, okay. that focused on economic development, agricultural economics, uh, rural development, uh, and trade. And so I took all these courses and sort of concluded that, you know, maybe I don't want to be part of the UN, maybe... Uh, you know, maybe I'm kind of more interested in trade, not aid, and that that may be a more robust way for uh, poor people and poor countries, other than the most desperately uh, poor in least developing countries, um, to get a hand up and, and make their way. And so 
I kind of stumbled into a job one day at the U.S. Trade Representative's office because somebody else had turned it down the week before. They were looking for an agricultural trade negotiator, and I had agriculture, and I had trade on my resume, and I stayed in that field ever since I discovered within three weeks that I loved it. So that's kind of how I ended up in, in trade policy. Oh, that's that's really cool. And that and that fits exactly with our mission at the Chali Institute as examining international trade and the way that it can generate prosperity for a lot of people. So I'm just curious, what countries specifically did you did you grow up in? Ah, OK, so um, Togo, uh, okay. Eastern Nigeria, uh, Sierra Leone in West Africa, uh, Tunisia in North Africa and Thailand. Uh, oh, okay. And then, of course, when I joined the Foreign Service, my very short-lived Foreign Service career, um, uh, which is the one that convinced me that there are other ways of serving your country internationally, um, that was in in Tokyo, as you mentioned. Yeah. So, so were both your parents in the Foreign Service, or or just my your... dad? Went. My dad was in State Department, and then he went to USAID, uh, the development arm, and uh, eventually he went to the International Labor Organization uh, in Geneva, and. Uh, my mom, uh, who was an incredible executive secretary, she worked in each one of the posts that uh, he served in because there was always a need for, for her services. Oh, neat. So did you talk about international issues at the dinner table at night and stuff when, when you were a kid growing uh, up? We did. We did talk about international issues and, you know, you sort of lived through a couple of coups, lots of coup d'etats during, you know, in those countries at the times we were living there. And we did a lot of travel in addition to where we were living. Uh, and civil war, you watch civil wars. I mean, it's, it's all upfront and personal uh, when you're there. And uh, as I said, you see incredible poverty in many cases and you see some corruption and you see, you see ways things can get done and ways they aren't supposed to get done. Uh, and you just learn a lot on the ground. And it was an incredible way of growing up. And, and you, you, have, you, you learn to have the capacity of putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, uh, which helps a whole lot when it's time to negotiate trade agreements. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. And I think that's a, a really good example about how you know, we can be inspired by you know, learning more about some problem that exists and then inspire that to or use that as inspiration to do something as a career that really can make a difference. So that's a I, that's a great story for everyone to hear. And so along those same kind of themes is that you were you were named as woman pioneer uh, by the WTO for your role as being the only female U.S. trade representative representing the United States in the Doha round of the World Trade Organization negotiations and for the significant role that you've played in shaping international trade policy. And so uh, I know there's a lot of people inspired by your story and I'm inspired as well, but since this is Women's History Month, I wanna focus on if there are any, maybe there's young female uh, that are aspiring to be you know, in international trade or, or public servants or, or just focused on something related to international issues, would you have some kind of advice that you could give them for oh. getting into a career like this? Yeah, absolutely. And this is a great career for women, a uh, great career for men too, but great career for women. Um, one of the things worth pointing out, uh, the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative has been around since 1962. Um, Catherine Tai, who is the newest USTR, uh, who was uh, sworn in last week, is not the first woman USTR, not the second, not the third, she's the fourth. So we stopped counting after four. Nobody makes a big deal because it's not uncommon to have a woman trade representative. And when I went to work at USTR, there were quite a few women, this is a long time ago, uh, there were quite a few women in lower and sort of middle echelon positions, in part because no one was paying attention to trade. And in part because you can get into the trade field from so many different angles. And I think this is the what is so cool about international trade, right? So it's, it's international economics, it is domestic economics, it is foreign policy, and it is uh, domestic politics. But people who are in the field come at it from business or business schools, come at it from law, come at it from area studies, you know, China experts, uh, European experts, uh, people come at it from agriculture, right? 
uh, sector specific expertise, technology experts, um, agricultural experts. So you have all of these people who come together at places like the Commerce Department, the, the State Department, the Agriculture Department, USTR, and the way trade policy is made in the United States, it's an interagency process, multi-agencies working together to come up with the best positions for the United States of America, uh, which may not always be USDA's position or may not always be the Department of Commerce's position. And one of the roles that USTR has is to help broker that for the White House. Oh, uh, cool. So there's a lot of negotiating, not just with other countries, but a lot of negotiating that occurs. I, one, of the, one of the pieces of advice that I have given to every USTR who has come after me is be prepared to spend half of your negotiating time negotiating with domestic constituencies because you end up spending a huge amount of time negotiating with the Congress, negotiating with domestic interest groups, uh, uh, negotiating with uh, other US government agencies. You spend as much time in domestic negotiations as you do in international negotiations. Yeah, see, that's, that's really surprising to me. I mean, that's, that's really an interesting uh, aspect of it. Um, so, to, so given you talked about, you could come up about it from an economic standpoint or go into this career from an economics point of view, from a wide variety of different points of view, you know, specialized in a particular commodity or, you know, uh, law, whatever the case may be. So is there a specific type of training for a young person? I mean, let's just say you, there is a young person that has their heart set on being U.S. trade representative someday. Is there a specific type of training that you would recommend? So there, if you had to pick one background for where you find more trade people, um, background for trade people, it probably is law and law school graduates. I would argue, and you know, forgive me my lawyer friends, I think there are too many lawyers in the trade field. Um, but, but that is because it makes the trade field more litigious oh. rather than more reflective of the needs of agriculture, the needs of business, the needs of workers, the needs of consumers. It becomes very you know, let's write very specific laws uh, and, and enforce them. And, and I think you need to be more realistic. So I'd like to see more business people, you know, more people with business degrees, more people uh, who specialize uh, in uh, intellectual property rights, more people who are tech experts, who want to spend a couple years in government doing it. Agriculture, very prominent um, agricultural expertise. And so I think it's that mix that makes it healthy. But if you had to pick one field, it's law. And, and I would say they aren't always the happiest campers because frequently they end up with the most boring parts of the equation, which is the anti-dumping and countervailing duty parts, which I'm sure they, I know, I know they love, but I find kind of gruesome uh, as opposed to you know, the broader trade policy, trade politics, trade negotiations. So there are a lot of trade lawyers who've gotten into the trade business who kind of wish they could be doing other things. I would say, regardless of what field, you have to take economics. You have to take international economics and ideally micro and macro, you know, so that you have a sense of how, how the global economy works, what a non-market economy is, um, you know, how our agricultural economy works. I mean, you, things like that, you just need to know that whether you're going a law route, whether you're doing area studies, whatever it is, don't shy away from the economics. Because if you don't understand the economics and the business side, you, you're not going to understand the needs of um, constituencies. Uh, and that includes labor, and that includes agriculture, and that includes consumers. Right. So, so I didn't even pay you for that uh, answer. And, and I'm an economist in the College of Business. So anyway, so that was a great, <laughs> great answer from our perspective, too. Uh, you, you have a very interesting story about how you became the U.S. trade representative under George W. Bush in 2006. And I've heard you tell this story, and I just think it's a really good story for, for everyone to hear about how, how you interviewed. And maybe you didn't even realize that it was an interview, but it's a, it's a really great story. And if, if you could tell that. I'd so, so, John, I have to commend you for doing your homework because I have only told that story once on the record. Oh. Um, I have not told that story more than once on the record. Okay. So um, 
you know, one of my philosophies, one of my approaches to careers is, um, you know, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And, and this is uh, a very uh, sort of my best example of that. I had been brought in as deputy U.S. trade representative uh, when Rob Portman was the USTR. And one of the intractable trade issues for decades um, is a softwood lumber issue between Canada and the United States. And it has gone on for decades. And it had gone on for, I don't know, 20, 25 years before I was told, now you're going to work on this, Susan. And I thought, oh my gosh, uh, I am dreading this. But, you know, it's what you do. And so I inherited this uh, issue. There had been six failed bilateral agreements at the point where I picked it up. And uh, Ambassador Portman one day said, Susan, you got to go over to the White House and brief the president on what's going on in the softwood lumber negotiation. And I was scared to death. I had never met the president, um, let alone brief him about an ugly topic like this. And Rob didn't come with me. I mean, Senator, Senator Port now Senator Portman didn't come with me. And so I went over to the White House and it was a briefing in the Oval Office. And I had never been in the Oval Office and I'd never met the president. And there were a handful of other people there and I had to brief him. And um, at the end of the briefing, he said, thank you very much. And he said, here are my instructions for you as, you know, as my negotiator, fix it. <laughs> Fix it. Now, I will say, after having been George W. Bush's trade negotiator, he's the perfect boss. You know exactly where he's coming from. He delegates. He gives you all, he empowers you as a boss. And he gives you pretty clear instructions, like negotiate the best deal you can. But if there's no good deal on the table, you're allowed to walk away. Hmm. Right? I mean, that kind of, that kind of, um, set of instructions. But in this case, it was the only time that I was told, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care whether people end up hating you or hating me, fix it. So I thought, okay, I, I know what I have to do. Um, and there were others in the room who would end up having to help me uh, on the political side. And I left. I did not know that it was not only a briefing about softwood lumber, it was also my job interview for USTR. And thank goodness I didn't know. Uh, but the president had decided that Ambassador Portman was going to become the director of the Office of Management and Budget. And I was being interviewed to take his place as USTR. And uh, I got the job. And we fixed the softwood lumber uh, issue uh, for nine years anyway. Uh, and then nine years at the end of the agreement we negotiated, which was a nine year agreement, it fell apart again. But at least it lasted for nine years. <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great story. And and it's a good lesson in life, like you said, just be prepared and I mean, and then and do your best. And, you know, you never know when you actually are interviewing for a position, I guess. So that's that's really cool. Uh, so I, I want to transition a little bit to some trade issues that uh, are affecting the United States or from a U.S. perspective. And so recent polls have come out that I think on a very positive sign show, have shown that most Americans have a favorable view of international trade. However, I still think that there's a significant misunderstanding of international trade in America. And I think there's a significant portion of people that have some misperceptions such as thinking that exports are good and imports are bad, or, or that thinking that trade is a zero sum game and that the only way that one country can gain from trade is at the expense of another country. And so I've taught, international business a lot. And so I teach comparative advantage. I mean, and so the students, you know, when they understand it, they kind of light up and that changes their view. But short of teaching everybody in America comparative advantage, what's the best way that we can convince Americans that international trade really is beneficial to people? So you, you, you are laying out absolutely the right issues because um, whereas there's sort of a general support for trade in terms of polling data, our politicians tend to be, tend not to be willing to give um, the American people the straight answer on trade, that it's easier to demagogue on trade than it is to explain that both exports and imports 
are good, right. uh, that to the extent that there are negative impacts from imports, and there can be negative impacts from imports, uh, that the answer to those generally are not, the, the answers generally are non-trade answers. Sometimes they're trade answers, like if you've got dumped product or subsidized product coming into your market. Uh, at that point, you want to put up an anti-dumping duty or you want to put up a countervailing duty. But in many cases, most cases, the it's technological change or it's uh, automation that is having an impact and people need to be um, empowered and enabled so that they can move to higher paying jobs, higher up the higher up the um uh, value-added scale, right? Yep. And so politicians, uh, I think politicians don't give the people enough credit. Uh, so I'll start with that. Uh, the, I think what can be done and what should be done, and this is by politicians, but it's also by other leaders in the community, journalists. I find governors are pretty good at this. I find mayors are good at this because they're closer to the ground. Um, they can point out, here are the jobs in my state or my community that are clearly associated with exports from this community, yeah. right? So you've got you've got some machinery exports in North Dakota. Yep. You, are, yep. you are in the top 10 agricultural exporting states. Yep. And if others didn't take your agricultural exports, um, what would we be doing with them? And therefore, Presumably, we need to be taking other people's exports as well. And so if you think about trade between states of the union, uh, that's a good example to game out, right? You've got parts produced in one place, parts produced in another place. You hear a lot about supply chains lately. Yeah. Um, but I think you have, to tell, you have to tell a story that is more compelling and that it, it, it shows how the pie can grow rather than it being a zero sum. Um, and you have to call politicians on demagoguing because the facts do not uh, support demagoguing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, and that may, that reminds me of uh, just thinking about the you're talking about the media. It's very easy for to write a story, let's say, on some plant that's closing down because of international trade. But and because I mean, you it's really easy. You identify this plant. You know all the workers. You know who work there. But it's a lot, sometimes it's more difficult to identify the winners because they're more, they tend to be oftentimes more spread out among society and people don't always know that their jobs um, are the result of international trade. I mean, that they've received a job because of international trade and an right. opportunity. So anyway, I think that's really it, excellent. It leads, it leads. I mean, one of the things that companies that export, I think should be doing more of, and I know several companies that do this already. Uh, for example, when you've got a piece of machinery Going down the going down the uh, production line, put a flag on it that shows where it's going, what its destination is. Oh. So, for example, at Boeing, if you go on the Boeing line, the tail of the plane shows you what airline is buying it. Oh. And most of those planes are leaving the country. Similarly, if you go to a Caterpillar plant, they put a a metal uh, you know magnetic flag on the machine to show everybody, to show the employees who are on the line, this product is going to this country and that product is going to that country so that you have your employees better able to understand the extent to which that their jobs and their paychecks are attributable to other countries taking US exports. And this, by the way, is one of, I think one of the things that's hardest to get across. We have had politicians who said the U.S. just doesn't make things anymore. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is we manufacture a whole lot. And with the exception of points of recession, U.S. industrial output, U.S. manufacturing output has steadily gone up over the years. What has not gone up is manufacturing employment. Right. But manufacturing output has gone up. The challenge, though, is when you and I walk into a store and we're looking at consumer goods, most of those are imported. They're gonna have made in Vietnam, made in China, made in Indonesia labels. However, 
we're not going to see the stuff that's made in the United States, the airplanes, the airplane engines, the heavy machinery, the industrial machinery, the turbines. We don't see those, but those are huge, high value added products that are U.S. industrial exports and very, very important. And we don't see the agricultural commodities, most of us. Yeah, well, that's an, that's an excellent point. And, and I like the idea of uh, flagging things about where they're going. That's really, that's really cool, too. Um, so th speaking about supply chains, so that we know that there's been a lot of disruptions in global supply chains as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and so some people have suggested that the United States should pursue policies that try to encourage U.S. companies to produce more things at home, like particularly, uh, you know, medical products or medical technology and high technology products. And so I'm curious, how do you feel about that kind of suggestion that people have made? Uh, that is a great, it's a great question, because obviously in view of COVID, it's one of those things that all of us are, are talking about. And, and in view of, of U.S.-China issues, it's, it is an issue um, having to do with secure supply chains uh, and secure trading partners. And I think it's, it is, it doesn't make sense for the U.S. or indeed any country to think or to try to make everything themselves in their own country. First of all, in my experience, if you don't meet the competition outside of our market before they get to our market, um, you're in trouble. So our automakers, you know, Detroit discovered that to their chagrin in the 1980s. So you want to have a competitive manufacturing operation, not just in the U.S., but also for export and outside the U.S. so that you are able to compete and adapt with the best that's out there. So that's one. Um, two, uh, we're not going to end up, I mean, if you think about, I mean, think about pharmaceuticals and look at how the process is working. Um, are you going to make everything that has to do with the syringe and everything that has to do with the inputs and the ingredients when we don't know what the next need is going to look like, what the next pandemic is going to look like? I mean, there were uh, uh, N95 masks that were stored away and from the last scare and the rubber had all deteriorated, right? Mm. So what are you going to stockpile? How much are you going to stockpile? Where are you going to stockpile it? So I think rather than, than say, let's, let's near shore, reshore and do it all ourselves. I think a better plan is to sit down with some trusted trading partners, trusted allies and say, all right, what are the really critical items that we would want and need to have access to in another crisis? Uh, whether it is, PPE or vaccine production products, ingredients, inputs, um, or indeed anything else related to uh, the industrial, you know, the, the military industrial base, right? This is the d d discussion going on about semiconductors right, right. now, among other right. things. Um, and sit down with trading partners and say, all right, can we agree on what fits into this box? Ideally, it's as small a box as possible because you can use national security as an excuse for a lot of protectionism. Um, and then who, which, can you diversify your sources of input? Can you create sustainable and safe um, supply chains so that if one chain gets disrupted, you've got others to fall back on so that the countries you fall back on are countries that you can trust not to use coercive diplomacy. And let's face it, everyone's going to have to behave a little bit better than they are right now or have in the last year in terms of holding back product for themselves rather than sharing it with, with uh, allies. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. I, I love the point about diversifying the supply chains or having different options too, because I mean, people, one thing people don't think about and it, is that maybe suppose we try to nearshore everything. What if something happens in the United States? I mean, are they all, there could be a natural disaster that disrupts that supply chain as well, right? I mean, so it's- It's, it's I, a trade off. I mean, it's, it's a matter of identifying, I would argue the minimum number of products and recognizing that you are going to sacrifice efficiency for sustainability. Yeah. And 
to what extent is the government willing to help? I mean, there the best example there is rare earth minerals, rare earth minerals, uh, uh, rare minerals that are used in uh, electronics, where most of them are produced in China, and China periodically turns off the spigot. Uh, and does great damage to the Japanese economy, threatens the US economy. And then just as investments go into Australia and US production, so we have our own sources of production because the prices are high, uh, China turns on the spigot again, the prices, world prices drop, and it becomes uneconomic for a commercial enterprise to keep investing in a non-Chinese source. So. Examples like that, government's got to get involved and decide, all right, is this a national security issue or not? And if it is, what are we collectively willing to do to sustain it, even if it's not going to be as efficient as a market working because the market may not work? Yeah, and, that, and that's a really good segue into the, the next thing I wanted to ask you about. So speaking of China, I mean, so there's a lot of people concerned about the heavy state involvement in trade and investment in China. So for example, state-owned enterprises are very heavily involved in international trade in China. Also, there's been forced technology uh, transfer in order to invest in China and stealing of intellectual property. And the Trump administration tried to address this by putting up really high import tariffs on Chinese products. And so I'm wondering, first of all, how do you are you concerned about heavy state owned or state involvement in trade and investment by China? And is, we don't think, I mean, I think that the tariffs didn't work out very well. So what do you think the best approach is to try to get China to change so that they don't uh, have, they have a more market oriented approach to trade investment? So yes, I am concerned. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to tell you that I think there are ways of getting China to change. I'm not sure there are, not under Xi Jinping. Mm. Um, I think that, that you know, it's, it's very, very sad because over the years I have been involved in doing business in China and there are reform-minded individuals in China who really, really want, wanted and want to move that economy into a more uh, market-oriented direction. They have been squashed. And uh, Xi Jinping with the, you know, his, what, PhD in Marxist economics uh, has taken over. And when we talk about China, we got to be careful. Because when we talk about China, we're really talking about Beijing and the Communist Party. We're not talking about the Chinese people. I mean, oh, they're suffering from this uh, just the way others are. Uh, so it's really, it's sad. I find it very, very sad because there was so much promise. So in the near term, uh, uh, Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party and the Wolf Warriors are convinced that 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 China is rising, the East is rising, and the West is is uh, in decline. They are absolutely convinced of it. And so the first thing we need to do is show them that the West is not in decline. I mean, we have hiccups from time to time, but you know, you look at our economy and you look at the uh, uh, innovativeness and creativity uh, that is represented in this economy. You know, look at where the Look at where the the, the uh, vaccines came from. Uh, yeah. uh, so there's a lot to be said. And we need to be, you know, we are so preoccupied with the bad thing because we're a democracy and we want to fix things that are wrong. So we're right. so preoccupied with the things that are wrong and goes back to the media. They just want to focus on the things that are wrong, right? It bleeds, it leads. Uh, we need to be much more vocal about the many areas where we're really strong. I mean, there's a reason they steal technology. The Chinese government is mm -hmm. stealing technology from the United States because we're generating it. So um, I think the thing that worries me the most is the theft of technology by a whole variety of means. Uh, I think that tariffs, you know, I, I give the I give the Trump administration credit for taking on this issue. Except they wielded, you know, they wielded the lever and nothing's happened. Now, they would argue that the phase one deal with China has a number of structural, I mean, the key is structural issues, right. not the bilateral. I mean, part of the problem was the president's obsession with the bilateral trade deficit. 
which as you know, has more to do with macroeconomic factors than, than trade yep. barriers per se. Yep. Um, so, but, it, it, but I think Bob Lighthizer, the last USTR, understood that it was the structural issues, the forced technology transfer, as you mentioned, for example, the heavy subsidies that result in um, uh, market-driven US companies and European companies and so on, having to compete against the Chinese government and the Chinese government's pocketbook and these huge state-owned enterprises. And then you have China's mistakes uh, where they end up with huge over, you know, these subsidies end up with huge overcapacity in steel and aluminum and uh, solar panels and eventually uh, electric vehicles and um, uh, semiconductors. And you could argue, well, we should be happy that the Chinese are going to be subsidizing our consumption of solar panels and uh, electric vehicles. And then you have to step back and say, do we really want China to be the only country in the world with the technology to produce both of those items? Because that's the direction that they're going in. Uh, in less than two years, 38 US solar panel companies were wiped out, leaving two, one in bankruptcy. I mean, so this is, this is not a lack of competitiveness. This is being wiped out by, by uh, unfair trade practices. So what, what can we do about it? Um, you use the traditional tools, as I said, anti-dumping and, and anti-subsidy uh, measures. That's generally not enough. You above all have to work with allies, both directly and uh, through the WTO to enforce existing agreements, which we have not done a particularly good idea, a good job of, um, and to call the question and just to, uh, if we're all taking measures together, the Chinese government, Beijing does a really good divide and conquer job. Um, you know, they, if you look at what they're doing, they're, if you look at what Beijing is doing to Australia right now, I mean, beating the stuffing out of Australian exports and then going to other countries saying, well, you can fill this void and you can fill this, why don't you fill that? Or what they're doing to Canada same thing. I mean, we have to be there to look, you know, to, to show a united front. Otherwise, they're going to continue to pick off individual um, trading partners. Right. It's, I mean, so that makes me think about um, you actually initiated the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was a trade agreement between the United States and 11 other countries, including Japan, and accounting for would have accounted for 40 percent of GDP globally. And so do you think that an op there's an opportunity for the United States to get back into that? Is that maybe a, a way to address this with allies, as you say? Well, I think obviously that the Trans-Pacific Partnership would have been a great idea. And I'm very sorry the Obama administration wasn't able to bring it home. Um, and you'll recall that, that the Obama administration and Hillary Clinton abandoned it and Donald Trump beat up on it and it didn't get past the last election. I mean, the election, presidential election before that. Right. Uh, it would have been a really good idea. I mean, you, you look at just this year, China has uh, concluded uh, the RCEP uh, regional agreement in the East Asia Pacific area. The U.S. is on the outside of that. Uh, our uh, TPP partners, the other 11, got together and closed that deal without us. Uh, every time there's an agreement like that, uh, the, and they're uneven in terms of their quality. Uh, TPP is a much stronger agreement, for example, than RCEP, but it doesn't matter. If you have these trade agreements, um, your small and medium-sized companies in the U.S. that used to export to this block is uh, put at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis other members of the block. Right. And your major multinationals are also put at a disadvantage, but they can adjust by investing within the block and manufacturing there rather than exporting right, members right. of the block. And either way, you lose. The US loses right, right. from not being a part of it. And I'm sorry to say that the authority that um, we use to get trade agreements through Congress, which is referred to as Fast Track or Trade Promotion Authority, runs out July 1 this year. 
Mm-hmm. And the Biden administration doesn't show any sign of wanting to renew it. So we'll see, uh, you know, the Biden administration is wants to focus on domestic economic issues and COVID first. I get that. And we'll see what happens afterwards. But I think it's really hard to have a robust foreign policy uh, vis-a-vis China if you're not in the game on trade deals. Yeah, so, so that leads to just just one follow up question. You may have answered part of this already, but so do you see some opportunities for the United States um, in the future in terms of making future trade regional trade agreements or negotiating broader multilateral reductions in trade barriers worldwide? Oh, I do absolutely. I mean, look at USMCA. You know, the the NAFTA successor to NAFTA that was negotiated in the Trump administration, the parts of that that make me uncomfortable, but there's a whole lot of that that's good. I mean, for example, digital trade. Challenge we have with the WTO is that the last time that uh, we have a major multinational agreement under the WTO, it was 1993, 1994. And you think about all the technologies that didn't exist, you know, the services technologies, the electronic data related technologies. So those aren't covered. And so those are increasingly covered by bilateral and regional deals. And so, for example, the Trump administration did a deal with Japan, a little mini deal with Japan, but it included a pretty robust digital trade provision. Uh, USMCA has a pretty robust digital trade provision. TPP or CPTPP, the TPP without the U.S., has a decent um, digital trade provision. So there's some potential for plurilateral, meaning multi-country, Uh, deals like that that are sectoral. And I think there's some promise there. Uh, The WTO members did a trade facilitation deal a few years ago, uh, again, on a plurilateral basis, multi-country basis. That was, uh, it was a lot of work, but it was doable. We're looking at an environmental goods agreement. Unfortunately, the Chinese have been pulling us back for more than a decade. I think we should just go ahead without them and make it a non- Non most favored nation deal. We it's too too weedy to get into, um, but but yeah, I think there's some potential, and um, I think the rest of the world would really welcome uh, the U.S. getting engaged again. Great, and I I just got you may have seen me turn around. At my I had my alarm on and my phone telling me I have to stop questions with you, but I have one more question I want to ask you before we go to the to the uh, the Q and A. So. So one other question, I mean, this time is flying by too quickly, but one other question I want to ask you is one of the, the industry where there's been, has not been significant progress in reducing barriers to trade is in agriculture. And I want to ask you that because you actually started your career being an agricultural negotiator in USTR. And so, in fact, one of the areas where that held up the negotiations in the Doha round of World Trade Organization was agriculture failure to agree on reducing trade distorting subsidies and tariffs in agriculture. And so do you think that, I mean, and I know in manufacturing, there's been huge progress made in reducing barriers to trade. So do you think that there in the future that will ever resolve uh, agricultural issues on a worldwide level so we can get rid of trade distorting subsidies and tariffs in agriculture? Uh, I hope so. And I think you, you, your characterization of it is right on target, which is trade distorting subsidies. I mean, the U.S. subsidizes our agricultural right. production. And some of our subsidies are arguably trade distorting, meaning having a, 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 the impact of lowering uh, prices outside the United States. That's sort of been the working definition of trade distorting. Um, I think people don't care if we have subsidies that support the income of farmers and farm families. But if the way you're doing it encourages production artificially and that depresses the global price and therefore you're um, hurting other farmers in the world because they don't have the income support, that's considered to be uh, a bad uh, uh, subsidy. So the effort has been to try to reach an agreement on those trade distorting subsidies, and we just haven't been able to do it. And uh, there are a couple of countries that just stand in the way, and they, I would argue it's not the U.S., uh, but, but th- there are other countries that would argue we're part of the problem, not part of the solution. So I think in theory it's possible, but at this point, China 
you know, China's decided it wants to be self-sufficient in foodstuffs. And the only way they can do that is by subsidizing the you-know-what out of their production, because it is, you know, they are a an arid, so much of their land is arid. Um, and so um, it, it, it is arid, arid and they have pollution problems. And the, the combination means they're going to have to do a whole lot of subsidizing uh, that they shouldn't have to do. I mean, they do not have comparative advantage in agriculture. Uh, but they have chosen that path. I will tell you, I will finish with one anecdote. Uh, my first job, uh, as you know, or as I noted, was as an agricultural trade negotiator. And here's what I learned about agricultural trade negotiating. I went up to the Hill one day with the then USTR uh, to meet with an agricultural uh, caucus in the House. And um, uh, no, it was, it, well, anyway, it was an agricultural caucus. And we left the meeting and the USTR, the then USTR turned to me and said, Susan, you need to remember that every state has two senators and at least two cows. <laughs> so the politics of agriculture, no matter what country you come from and negotiate from, is always harder than any other sector. Agriculture, and it used to be textiles and apparel was a close second, but that's sort of opened up. Agriculture is the worst politically for everyone. Uh, so that's that's why agriculture isn't is, isn't close to where we are in industrial goods subsidies. Right, but but I've heard I've heard people say that that actually if we got rid of trade distorting subsidies and tariffs, the U.S. agricultural industry would actually do very very well. I mean, oh, absolutely, because it's not you know when you look at we used to have, you know, red light, green light, amber. Uh, we, we had these classifications and, and the red category were the subsidies that were trade distorting. The green were anybody can do them. Uh, and the yellow were, you know, arguable. Um, and we used to, what we were trying to do in the Doha round was to put a limit on how many red category and how many yellow category uh, subsidies a country, a developed country versus a developing country could use. And um, the US doesn't need a whole lot of red category subsidies to be fully competitive because we have comparative advantage in agriculture. Right. right. Yeah. So although I, I would like to monopolize your time, I, I have a commitment to ask some questions from the audience. And so the first question uh, says, uh, the, this is from Heather Rank, who's with the U.S. Commercial Service, and so she says a shout out from the U.S. Commercial Service, North Dakota, in Fargo, and she says we're so happy to see you join this program today, and that your leadership at the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service made a lasting impact on our agency. So, great so job. Do not, do not tell the USTR people, but my favorite job of my entire career was being director general of the US and foreign commercial service. And you go district office, because you guys are the backbone of US exports, particularly small, medium-sized companies. And I'm so proud of you. Yeah, yeah, Heather, Heather does a fantastic job here. And so so she has a question. Do you do you have some recent examples of countries whose open trade policies are making a big positive impact on their economies? Okay, great question. Um, Heather, let me think. Um, uh, I would look at, I'd look at Vietnam. Um, I would look at China, quite frankly. I mean, you know, it's, it's hard to look at China and say, and say nice things right now. But the fact of the matter is, when China joined the WTO, it did a dramatic, well, in advance of that, and, and when they immediately joined, they reduced and eliminated a huge number of trade barriers, right. um, massive number of trade barriers. And in fact, uh, their level of trade barriers compared to, for example, Japan uh, in the 70s, the Chinese market was much more open. And you can look at that double digit growth every year in China and see what that did. I mean, the irony of, of Xi Jinping's commitment to state-owned, state-organized, state-driven economics is that this incredible growth in the Chinese market came from the point at which the Chinese market was opened up, uh, not closed. So, so I would say China, I would say look at Vietnam, particularly in view of CPTPP, 
I mean, we, we may not benefit from that, uh, but the Vietnamese figured it out uh, and uh, wanted to go with us. Um, look at uh, what happened with Peru and Colombian economies right after they joined the bilateral free trade agreements with mm -hmm. us, uh, because those, they used to have preferential one-way access to the U.S. market under, and, under the Andean Pact. Pact. And so when we uh, negotiated a bilateral free trade agreement, effectively, um, they opened their markets and ours were already open. And what they were buying was the certainty of ours never closing. And that brought with it investment and reduced capital flight. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you look at the first couple of years, uh, uh, the level of foreign direct investment shot way up. And you could see that in terms of their economic growth. So those are examples off the top of my head. Yeah, those are great examples. And one of the things that uh, a lot of people, I think, are surprised about is if you look at extreme global poverty, uh, it's gone down tremendously. And a lot of that coincides, you mentioned China, coincides with China opening up to the world market. I mean, a lot of the reduction in extreme poverty has been in China because oh, yeah. of their participation in the global system. So hundreds, hundreds of millions of people were taken out of abject poverty because they moved toward market economics. Yeah, yeah, Thanks. it's a great argument for for uh, free market economics, I, I agree. Um, and so uh, here's a question from Pat Stocker. So, uh, and uh, so she, she says, what approach do you expect the newly confirmed US Trade Representative Catherine Tai to take in her new role? Uh, well, I think it's still evolving. Kat, I'm a great fan of Catherine Tai's. I think she was a terrific pick by the Biden administration. Um, I, I know her from the trade policy community in Washington is pretty small. Uh, it's the USTR folks are pretty bipartisan um, and generally agree on a lot of things. Um, not everything, but a lot of things. Uh, and Catherine is, is terrific. I think she was a good choice. Uh, Catherine was pretty articulate in her uh, statement as she went through her confirmation uh, hearing process. She's obviously on board President Biden's um, uh, worker-centric trade policy plans. Um, I think you get that every paragraph or so when she's talking. Uh, she also recognizes there are China issues. And, and I think the um, she's got to decide, one of the big things they have to decide with um, Trade Promotion Authority, Fast Track Authority expiring July 1, is do they want to try to finish the UK-US uh, trade agreement when they have said they don't want to do any trade agreements for a while? because they only have one shot and mm -hmm. um, they may decide not to, which I think would be a terrible wasted opportunity, but they may decide that if they want to show the rest of the world that they're in the game at least. And boy, if they can't do a bilateral trade deal with the UK where they're not having to worry about human rights issues or worker rights issues or environmental issues, uh, they aren't going to be able to do a trade agreement with anyone. So um, I, I think she's going to be heavily into enforcement of existing trade agreements. Um, but she, um, she is somebody who has already done the negotiating with all domestic constituencies um, and some international constituencies from when she was at USDR. She's a lawyer. She used to be in the general counsel's office there. Um, so she's ready to, you know, she's ready to roll, rock and roll. Uh, and that, that reminds me of just one, I, I'm not going to, I want to ask just one other thing, and that's related to this, and that's how you talk about how the all the U.S. trade representatives get along with each other, even though you're from different political views, different administrations, and so, and you talk about how you, you take out the new U.S. trade representative to dinner, so have you done that yet with Catherine Tai? Uh, no, we haven't, uh, but that's a uh, COVID, you know, that's courtesy. Oh, of COVID. Yeah. So oh, that's we, we've agreed that, uh, once we've all been vaccinated and, uh, Catherine can come up to come up to breathe, that we will take her out to dinner. Sounds good. Cause that, that, I mean, I think that's a good lesson for everybody in a polarized world that we live in now that how you get together with a group of people that maybe you don't agree with everything on politically, but you get together to work on common things that you do agree on. So that's, that's excellent. Um, another question is, um, in your view, 
what is the greatest challenge to getting more free trade in the world or at least less barriers to trade? And then, uh, there um, and, and here I've, I've talked about how the U.S. participation technically, um, you know, it's hard to get trade agreements through the Congress. But I think as a general matter, we just have to keep showing, uh, demonstrating that open trade generates uh, economic benefits. And we have to make sure that where there are individuals and communities that are negatively impacted by trade, that we are looking after them. You know, whether that is trade adjustment assistance, whether that is vocational education, uh, whether that is unemployment insurance, whether that is portable portability of, of health care and pensions and so on. Uh, we need to make sure that that the two or three percent of those who are unemployed who can actually attribute their unemployment to something trade related um, are taken care of because uh, because their situation doesn't lend itself to trade solutions. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I would say look for examples. I mean, there are so many examples out there and there's so many communities out there. And governor, as I said, governors and mayors tend to get it in ways that congressmen and senators don't. And, and some of that, quite frankly, has to do with the primary process and gerrymandered uh, voting districts. Yeah, and this person asked one follow-up and that's, do you see the world trending towards more free trade or less? We were trending toward more free trade. Right now we're definitely trending toward less. The last couple of years yeah. during the Trump administration, they put up a whole lot of barriers. Uh, what was less evident was how many other barriers other countries put up, it wasn't just the US. Yeah, well, hopefully we'll move in the other direction again. So, uh, so, so then uh, we're out, we have three minutes left. So I'm gonna ask one last question that somebody asked here. And so uh, how does the United States compare to the rest of the world in women's involvement in trade representation? Oh, okay. Um, depends on the country. It's a great question. Uh, we tend, we are, uh, we have more or equal to uh, the best. So, for example, the EU Trade Commissioner, uh, they've had um, one woman, but only one woman. The rest of them have been guys. Uh, we've had three, I mean, four women. Um, on the other hand, the, I want to say the Norwegians, uh, one of the Nordic countries showed up at one point with an entire cabinet of women. Mm. And, and so that was pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, you, you get to Asia and you don't encounter too many women, although Malaysia used to have a woman trade minister. She was tough as nails. She was so good. Mm. Um, the um, New Zealand obviously has a woman prime minister, but hasn't had a woman trade minister to my knowledge. But the US, US seems to have more women. Uh, but my counterpart, when I was USTR, my counterpart, my Peruvian counterpart was a woman. Um, my Malaysian counterpart was a woman, my Indonesian counterpart was a woman. Uh, so there were a fair number of women in there. And again, it, it, in that case, there were, a lot, there were economists and politicians, a right. lot of PhD economists, very, very prominent, uh, interesting women. Uh, hmm. So it's, it's a mixed, you know, mixed background. Yeah, and isn't the, the U.S., the, I mean, the director general of the WTO is a woman now, true, yeah. right? For the first time, uh, yeah. a woman by the name of uh, Ngozi Okonjo Iwela, who is a Nigerian, yeah. uh, who has a PhD. Um, she's a development economist, actually. She's an economist. She worked at the World Bank. Uh, she just became the first woman uh, and the first African ahead uh, of the WTO. And we're very optimistic about what she'll be able to accomplish because she's going to be able to speak to other developing economies right. uh, in ways that they wouldn't have taken me seriously. Uh, right. The last director general was a Brazilian gentleman who was also very good, uh, but um, we're very optimistic about, I mean, the, the WTO is in trouble, so don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm optimistic that the new director general can have a, a you know, profound impact. Yeah, well, we need more economists in this field, then maybe the, the world will turn towards more free trade. 
because uh, economists should understand the benefits of free trade anyway, hopefully. Yep. So this is, I, I can't believe how fast this hour has flown by and I can't thank you enough for being here. It's really been an honor to talk to you. And this is, this has really been fun. A lot of insights and, and I have a whole bunch more questions I wanted to ask you, but, but anyway, I, I really appreciate it. And again, the Menard family and all our donors, we really appreciate this. And Pat Stocker, thank you for introducing us again to Susan Schwab and thanks again. And we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Susan. you. I really enjoyed it. And thank you, John. You're a great moderator. Oh, <laughs> thank you.